Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. It is so good to see you on this beautiful day in California for our second message of four in the America's 11th Hour series. This message is entitled, The Miraculous Rise of Liberty. So we talked about the pilgrims last night. That took us back to the 1600s, 1620, with the landing of the pilgrims. And in this, evening, this, this morning's message, we'll continue on with American history, going on to the founding generation and beyond. But before we say anything else, I want to share this quote and open with prayer. This message, we saw this last night, but especially this message, we're going to see that God has the destiny of this nation in his hands. That's a quote from a book called The Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, page 264. Wonderful book, but we saw so many times God intervening and providentially in history to bring forth the free nation that we call the United States of America, which we're going to see going forward in the, in the coming sessions, has a whole lot more going on than meets the eye prophetically. It has to do with truth and the truth going global. But before we say another word, I want to begin with prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to study history, which we know is his story, your story of how you led your people. And we want to be inspired by seeing your hand involved, even in, in secular events, in the, in the political and military world, to see how prophecy was being fulfilled. We want to behold your hand, your almighty hand, and come that much more to trust in you. And to see your character, that is our desire this morning, to see your face and your character as we understand the principles of liberty at the foundation of this country. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, our scripture is the same as it was yesterday. We studied Revelation 12, and we saw that toward the end of the story of the 1,260 years, from 538 to 1798, there would be a time where the earth would help the woman, and we decoded that from the scriptures, waters representing lots of people, earth being the opposite of waters, a relatively unpopulated or more sparsely populated area would become a haven for the woman, for the church, for the true people of God. And this applies not just to 1620, not just to the pilgrims, but it applies to the formation in the ongoing history of America. Now, before I get into the, mostly what we're gonna look at is the founding generation, but I wanna fast forward in the history to, we could just start with an amazing fact, or you could say this is a answer to prayer story in American history, and it has to do with George Washington Carver. His story is one that every American should know, but did you know that he discovered and popularized hundreds of uses for the peanut in answer to prayer, listen to how he explains it in 1920. He says, years ago, I went into my laboratory and said, dear Mr. Creator, please tell me what the universe was made for. The great creator answered, you want to know too much for that little mind of yours. Ask for something more your size, little man. Then I asked, please, Mr. Creator, tell me what man was made for. Again, the creator replied, you are still asking too much. So then I asked, Please, Mr. Creator, will you tell me why the peanut was made? That's better, but even that is infinite. What do, you want, what do you want to know about the peanut? Mr. Creator, can I make milk out of the peanut? And then the Creator taught me to take the peanut apart and put it together again, and out of the process have come forth all these products. A brilliant scientist, but he didn't take the glory on himself. He told the story of how God gave him the wisdom to do all the amazing things he did. He told a similar story before the House Committee, Ways and Means Committee, in Washington, D.C. He says, if you go to the very first chapter of Genesis, we can interpret very clearly, I think, what God intended when he said, Behold, I have given you every herb that bears seed, to you it shall be meat. This is what he means about it. It shall be meat. There is everything there in the, in the plant foods of the garden to strengthen and nourish and keep the body alive and healthy. And the chairman of the committee asked him, Dr. Carver, where did you learn all these things? He answered, from an old book. The chairman asks, what book? And Dr. Carver insists, the Bible. The chairman says, well, does the Bible tell about peanuts? No, sir, but it tells about the God who made the peanut. I asked him to show me. I asked him to show me what to do with the peanut, and he did. 
Isn't that a neat story, an answer to prayer story? Miracle stories abound, especially when we now go back to the 1700s and look at that period of the founding of the American Republic. And I'll go all over the place in the chronology today. We kind of told the chronological narrative last night, but in this one, we're going to be jumping around a bit. But a lot of the content is going to be clustered around in that, in that period of American independence. Now, the decades before that, Probably many are aware, if you know the American history, the 13 colonies were possessions of the British Empire, and there was no independent America yet in the 1740s and 50s where these first stories take place. But you have a war between the British and the French. The British Empire and the, and the French imperial conquests were carving up the world and warring for their imperial possessions, one versus the other. And in the 1740s, King George's War was going on, as it was called. New France, which was France's possessions in the New World, most notably Canada, Nova Scotia, New France's Louisbourg fell to the British in 1745. This was a big moment because the British were seizing more of the Atlantic coast and this was the third busiest seaport in North America. So France regrouped and they said, we have got to recapture Louisbourg. In 1746, they said, we're going to reconquer it and we're going to take Boston while we're at it. Now, if you know Boston, that's in Massachusetts, in Protestant Massachusetts under the British colonial possession. So you've got Catholic France now who's going to send 73 ships, 800 cannons, and 13,000 troops to reconquer Lewisburg and to take Boston from the British. Well, at this point, a pastor in Boston named Reverend Thomas Prince prays on October 16, 1746, the following words. Send thy tempest, Lord, upon the waters. Scatter the ships of our tormentors. Now, I have a question. If you've studied the prophecy with us last night, and you saw the earth helps out the woman, does the God of heaven have an interest in preserving Boston and the American colonies from being conquered by Catholic France? This was to be a haven for, especially Protestantism, a free land for anybody to worship as they feel led. But does God intervene? when you see what appears to be secular history and just these secular empires. But I'll tell you something. You know that Persia, when they conquered Babylon in the ancient times, the prophecies of the Bible said, Cyrus, my servant, will be doing this. And so God intervenes in these ways to foresee prophecy and fulfill providence. So America was was being preserved at this moment. What happened to the French Navy when this prayer was uttered? Soon after this prayer, the sky grew dark. The winds shrieked. A hurricane was on the Atlantic, and it scattered the French fleet as far south as the Caribbean. <laughs> Lightning struck, and exploding powder kegs and entire ships, and leaving destruction of the French Navy in its wake. Now, when I talk about a, a, uh, a storm that just so happened to come, it also reminds me of another war in American history later on in the chronology where Britain is trying to conquer the United, reconquer the United States in the War of 1812. So now you have the United States of America. Britain has invaded Washington, D.C. They've set the White House on fire. A number of other buildings in the Capitol are burning. And what happens? Well, all of a sudden, a great storm and a fierce tornado arises upon the British, killing many of their soldiers. It's reminiscent of that scripture verse, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The British fled the city, torrential rains for hours, extinguished the fires that they had set, and now they have to make it out of the city through mud, through downed trees that the tornadoes had split apart, and they have ships that are run aground, others have damaged rigging. The British Navy is going, okay, we're regrouped, we've got to go, we're outside of Baltimore, we've got to bombard the American fort with all the cannonballs we can muster because we've been foiled here, but guess what? The storm that had ravaged the British in Washington, D.C. takes a turn for Baltimore. You guessed it. And that very same storm is turning the ground to mud. The cannonballs, 1,800 cannonballs. The Americans have no, this is no contest. They can't, they can't hold off the strongest naval power in the world, but the Lord can. So he, he's foiling their efforts. And this is where the famous Star Spangled Banner came from. Francis Scott Key repenting the words and the flag was still there because the British Navy was unable to do its 
its power, and its, its destruction. So let's return now to that period just before American independence. And this is another war between the British and the French. The year was 1755, and they're in the midst of the Seven Years' War. You might remember this from your American history textbooks if you studied that as a child as the French and Indian War. That's just the American name for the same war. But the Seven Years' War was a global war. It was a world war between Britain and France once again. And this time, you've got a 22-year-old British colonel. You might know his name, George Washington. He's in a battle with the French, a land battle here, where the British are being decimated by the French. They're being annihilated. Every single officer on the British side is killed, except one. George Washington was the one who survived. Listen to his account of this. He says, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation, for I had, look at this, four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side. So again, Providence is holding off the French conquest of North America. In this case, preserving the life of a very important founding father. By the way, if you've ever read a book called Gospel Workers, very good book, it mentions George Washington. There's a section on him, and it's, you know, admiringly writing of his self-discipline and of his work ethic of this important and very, very, uh, very, very pivotal man in American history. So th these bullets literally going through his coats, being di diverted from his body. A similar story happened to a later president. I told you I'm jumping around in the chronology. Go now to the 1830s, President Andrew Jackson. An assassin approaches him with two pistols in his hand. He fires them both off, but they both, not one, but two pistols misfire, and he is preserved. And he put it this way, a kind of providence has been pleased to shield me against the recent attempt upon my life and irresistibly carried my many minds to the belief in a superintending providence. These guys believed, and they, you know, these are secular people, uh, you know, they, they have a, a religious understanding, but not in the same way as, 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 as many Bible-believing Christians. They understood, though, that there was providence. Do we? We'd better. <laughs> We'd better really understand God's superintending providence will provide always. Particularly when prophecy has predicted something, providence will provide that it takes place always and every time. Now, while we're on the topic of, you know, bullets going through coats and stuff, this is a real war hero. Clara Barton, founder of the American Red Cross, War hero? What do you mean? Well, she was delivering relief supplies to wounded soldiers, aiding in the search for missing soldiers. This incredible lady during the Civil War now, 1861 to 1865, she's carrying a wounded soldier from the battlefield. Doing, while doing that, a bullet, listen to her words, a ball, they called it at the time, musket ball, had passed between my body and the right arm, which supported him, cutting through the sleeve, cutting through her sleeve, and passing through his chest from shoulder to shoulder. There was no more to be done for him, and I left him to his rest. I have never, listen to that, she's never mended that hole in her sleeve. Soldiers don't get to mend the holes that go through their coats and, 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 and kill them, unless it's a rare occasion of providence, like Clara Barton experienced, going through the sleeve but not touching you, or George Washington. There's so many stories like this, I, I, and I was, I was thinking of her, you know, later on she, she helped people on both sides of that civil war. And, and that reminds me of love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Remember like the pilgrims did when we saw William Brewster and he was caring for the sick and dying and starving during that first winter that the pilgrims were here. Even the crew members who had cursed and hated and despised the pilgrims. Love your enemies. Now, back, back in the 1620s with those pilgrims, there were more bullets that went through coats. In this case, they were exploring the land in that first fall of 1620. And we talked about the Wampanoags, the Indian tribe that they became friends with. Not all were so friendly. As they were exploring the land, all of a sudden, there were, there were arrows raining down on them. It's not bullets this time, but arrows. But William Bradford writes, the, by the special providence of God, none of these arrows being bombarding them from the woods out of the blue, none of these arrows either hit or hurt us, though many came close by us, and some coats which hung upon our barricade were shot through and through. I've heard other miracle stories, you probably have too, of missionaries, and you know, you have a, a, a thief or a kidnapper or, or just a, a criminals who, who are trying to deter them, and the weaponry just doesn't work right. The bullets just don't look, work like they're supposed to work. 
Oh, these miracle stories get me every time. Let's go back to that founding era. George Washington and the War for Independence now. We've seen a little bit in the British versus the French, but there's a cluster of miracle stories during the period of America's founding. The first naval engagement, the Battle of Bunker Hill, this is the War for Independence, is started in 1775. The British Navy is ready to just go and teach these rebellious colonists a lesson. This ragtag Continental Army is no contest again for the British military power. But historians look at the fact that the British ships just so happened to have the wrong sized cannonballs for their cannon. And they go, well, what a coincidence that was. What a strange, unfortunate thing for the British that they had all these cannons ready to go, but they had the wrong size ball for the cannon. So 2,300 British soldiers had to disembark and charge the hill where they were going to just bombard it from the sea and use their military naval advantage. And they lost twice as many soldiers and casualties to that in that battle than the colonists did. They were no longer at an advantage. There was another time, by the way, in the war where the British were holding siege against the inhabitants of Boston. Siege is where you're trying to starve them out. You're preventing any supplies from going in or out. And this time, the British General House says, we're going to go in and finish them off. 3,000 troops are going to charge Dorchester Heights, and we're going to go get them. We've got the troops needed now and the strategy needed. But just like in the War of 1812, a strange storm arose. A violent storm caused turbulent seas, and they were unable to land their 3,000 troops. General Washington said at the time that this most remarkable interposition of providence is for some wise purpose, I have not a doubt. He had no doubt that, first of all, this was providence, and second of all, that there's some wise purpose that God is doing this for. He didn't understand the prophecies that we are studying this weekend together, but he did see the hand of God and saw that there must be some wise purpose. Oh, how about the great second advent awakening we're going to talk about this week, this, uh, this afternoon, and other things. But he he, he, did, he, he did know that, that God was guiding because uh, we'll see a quote from him later where he says many times we have seen the hand of providence. And in this one, he says, okay, the British are coming for New York now. They've got 32,000 troops, 400 ships. You're imagining masts like tree trunks uh, th throughout New York Harbor. This is the biggest land invasion force in human history up until this point. And Washington said at this point, we are not in men or in arms prepared for it. But the rest of the quote says this, providence will go on to afford us aid. The date is July 9, 1776. This is five days after what? July 9, 1776 is five days after July 4, 1776, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So new life is going to be breathed in to the faith and the resolve of these colonial soldiers. A copy of the Declaration of Independence is brought. Washington has it read to them, and it includes these words. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. You can see how that would be inspiring, right? Now, just to be clear, by the way, the Continental Army is not like the New Testament version of the Army of God in the Old Testament. Uh, th this is something Constantine got wrong in, in, in Christianity, so-called, in the fourth century. Uh, church and military would be united. He was betraying the, the mission of the New Testament church. The New Testament times, God's covenant is with the church, believers everywhere of all nations. It is not anymore a covenant with a nation as it was in the time of ancient Israel. So just to make that clarification. However, when God says something will happen in prophecy, he's going to make it happen. And this is a just cause indeed. That grand old document, that Declaration of Independence, became the most world-famous articulation of the unalienable human rights of all mankind. So Washington hears that read, the soldiers hear that read, that providence will afford us aid. 10,000 British troops are landed elsewhere to trap them between the sea and the 30,000 that are going to come this way. And an urgent need now is to retreat. There is nothing that they can do but retreat. Well, they have to retreat across the East River by night. And God just so, just so happened, no, it was God's providence making the waters of the East River notably calm, the waters where the British ships are notably boisterous, and they made half of their troops were able to escape by night across the East River, ship after ship, quickly ferrying them across. But here's the real miracle. In the morning, there's still half of them left. You're, you're going you're to get captured by the British from either side here. 
but a especially thick, notably thick fog rests upon the atmosphere that morning and shrouds their troops still as if it is night. So the British are waiting for the fog to lift, and by the time it lifted, every last soldier had made it across the river. George Washington was on the last boat across. A very dense fog seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I could scarcely discern a man at six yards distance, said Ben Talmadge, Washington's chief of intelligence. The British Army never again in the rest of the war had a chance to capture the entire Continental Army all at once, or even half of the Continental Army all at once. By the way, there's another dense fog story. I just love pairing these together. You see storms, you see bullets going through coats, you see dense fog. 1812 again, the War of 1812, the Battle of New Orleans with General Andrew Jackson before he was president, Colonel Andrew Jackson. A dense fog, this time miraculously lifted at the strategic time to allow the American forces to overwhelm the British forces and the casualties of the Americans were in the dozens, British in the thousands. General Andrew Jackson wrote, it appears that the unerring hand of, there it is again, Providence, shielded my men from the shower of balls, bombs, and rockets, while every ball and bomb from our guns carried with them a mission of death. The British gave up on the War of 1812, not only because of the fierce tornado and storm up in D.C. and Baltimore, not only because of this event and the, the loss in the Battle of New Orleans, but there was another thing, kind of like the Turks arising over in Europe centuries before, Napoleon, got the British a little distracted about this time in his conquests of Europe, so America was preserved. Now the Battle of Saratoga, back to the War of Independence again. The War for Independence, 1776, is a Declaration of Independence. We're well into the war, heading towards 1777 here. The British are ready to, ready, to, ready to seal the deal here. The Battle of Saratoga, one of the most important battles in world history. And it, against, again, all odds were against the American colonists. How could the, the, the Americans possibly win when you've got so many British reinforcements on the way? Well, why did the Americans win in the turning point battle in the war, the Battle of Saratoga? Let's, let's just hear Elihu Yale ask the question, to whom but the ruler of the winds shall we ascribe it, that the British reinforcements in the summer of 1777, reinforcement was delayed on the ocean three months by contrary winds until it was too late. The ruler of the winds, speaking of God's providence once again, preventing the British reinforcements from being able to come, which would have totally overwhelmed the Continental Army. George Washington called it a signal stroke of providence. And this was the turning point in the war because the French saw, wow, the British really aren't making much headway there. Maybe we should get involved too and help, uh, help finish them off. So the, the French became allies with the United States for a period of time at the end of the war to really tip the scales and turn the tide of that war against the British. Now, you just have to pause when you think about this. And regardless of our convictions on, on participating in combatancy and so on, people have sacrificed so much for the cause of freedom. And you just have to pause and be grateful for that, whether it's Thanksgiving or any time of the year. Um, I, I was thinking especially about that when I heard and learned about the starving ships that the British did. Have you ever heard about that? More Americans died on the British starving ships than died in battle in the entire war, which went on for several years. And, and, and that's what it sounds like, starving ships, literally, captured uh, prisoners of war were put on ships and deprived of food and water till they died. I mean, it's just cruel, inhumane, and, and just starving them to death. 90% casualty rate on these ships. They captured 12,400 American troops and 11,000 of them perished on these starving ships. Speaking of 11,000, another 11,000 were in the winter encamped at Valley Forge, freezing, literally freezing to death. 2,500 Americans died in the freezing conditions in December at Valley Forge. Limbs were black, were being amputated. I mean, this is an ugly scene, but it's a scene of unity. These are people from all these different states who have various different religious perspectives and cultures and so on. You even have people of, of, of Indian background, blacks, people, people from age 12 to age 60 at Valley Forge dying together for the cause of liberty. It just fills the heart with gratitude. The final act in defeat at the Battle of Cowpens and the pursuit of the Americans that followed is the key. The, the Americans won in the battle, then retreated. Now, the retreat is the interesting part. 
What happened? General Cornwallis of the British is pursuing the Continental Army after the battle is over. And they're some distance behind, perhaps two hours behind. So the Americans come to a river. Now crossing the river with your whole brigade is going to be a challenge. They get across, they get, the British are still far enough back, Whew, we made it across the river. Well, right after the Americans cross the river, a sudden storm arises again that causes the waters to rise and the British to have a substantial delay when they get to that same river to cross it. So now the Americans get to another river. This one's called the Dan River. The first one was the Catawba River. Here they are to the next river. The Americans get across again, and another flash flood blocks the British pursuit and slows them markedly down. British commander Henry Clinton said, here, speaking of at the Dan River, the Royal Army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters, which had only just fallen almost miraculously to let the enemy over. Even the enemy acknowledges, boy, it seems like they're getting some miracles on their behalf, on their side. So George Washington at the end of the war was able to conclude and summarize with this. We have abundant reasons to thank Providence for its many favorable interpositions in our behalf. It has at times been my only dependence, for all other resources seemed to have failed us. That was March of 1781 at the end of the war. Now, so far we've heard a lot about God having the destiny of this nation in his hands. We're going to see more why. It's not just for a nation. It's not just for these things. We're going to see in Revelation 13 that, that America was prophesied to have lamb-like qualities. There's another prophecy about America in Revelation 13 we're going to see in the next session. But it's important to make clear what that does not mean. When you see a lamb-like nation and you see God's interpositions of providence, we may be tempted to, to swing a little far in that description and go, okay, well, a lamb-like nation is, is a Christian nation. America is one nation under God. In God we trust. These are important themes, but what does that mean and what does that not mean? We've got to walk a, a tightrope here because this is an important thing to not go into the way that Constantine was or the way that Papal Rome was. Simply put, when you read America's founding documents, you read the Declaration of Independence, for example, you see an acknowledgement of a higher power a higher power than the state, that's important, a higher power than the government. God is the one who has endowed us with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But you also see, in the Constitution particularly, that enforcement of religion is absolutely prohibited. The Constitution tells the government, leave religion alone. So that's the definition of a Christian nation, of a lamb-like nation, not Christian rule by enforcement of Christianity at gunpoint, that would not be Christian because Christian is that which follows Christ. What did Jesus say? Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, it's the rulers of the Gentiles that lord it over them. Worldly unbelievers lord it over others and they exercise great authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you if you're a Christian, be a servant. That's a different mindset, isn't it? He says the Gentile way is to have dominion over others, to lord it over others, to enforce edicts and dictates. And for over a thousand years, you had so-called Christian nations in Europe where governments existed that were not lamb-like at all, but they claimed to be Christian. They were taking cues from Rome. So you don't actually want Christianity to try to rule. It's just not at its best. Uh, it's not being Christian when it's the Constantinian way of, dom it's called dominion theology. It's repugnant to the reader of the New Testament to think that we would say kill or conquer in the sign of the cross as, as Constantine did. So what makes America exceptional and distinct and different then? Well, it is a system that neither denies God nor enforces God. You see the tightrope here? So we acknowledge a creator who has endowed us with our liberties. And we do the Christian thing and allow people's freedom of conscience to choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. Yet at the same time, we don't enforce the religion that we know to be true because that would be a betrayal of that very religion. Romanism enforces religion and a false one at that, right? We talked extensively about that in Seven Deadly Myths. But there are other types of governments that go to the opposite extreme over here, deny God completely, and then the state becomes God. Have you heard of socialism, Marxism, communism? Marx said that religion is the opiate of the masses, and we need to uh, outlaw it completely. 
because that detracts from our theological meta-narrative, which is class struggle. It's all about class struggle, and that is where we want people to focus, that the proletariat would overthrow the bourgeoisie, and that the people who are having their, 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 their being alienated from their right just desserts would get them back from the evil capitalist uh, owners of the capital. That was his, his sort of view that was, that was replacing religion. Well, you also hear of cultural Marxism. That's another way of sowing division along lines other than class division. It would be along sexual orientation, gender identity, these kind of things. You divide society according to the villains and the virtuous, and we're going to recapture power from the supposed oppressors. So whatever Marxism, socialism, communism, cultural Marxism, these are all secular ideologies that enforce secularism. They, they, they replace Christianity and the God of heaven with a different ideology or narrative for good and evil and end up almost all the time viciously opposed, violently opposed to Bible-believing Christianity. Even if sometimes they wear the veneer of sort of this liberation theology and using Christian language, it's a dangerous, dangerous development over the last hundred plus years. And there was another revolution too. Around the time of the American Revolution, that was a godless revolution. It denied God. It was an atheistic revolution. Do you know which one I'm talking about? This is a famous one. You read about this one in the book, The Great Controversy, because you read uh, about the French Revolution in 1789. It was very destructive to life and to liberty. It ushered in the reign of terror, the guillotine, eventually Napoleonic France in its wake. Now, that's not to say that the people who the French were overthrowing are good guys necessarily, because that's the monarchy and that's papal Rome and the priest class of France. These revolutionaries were responding to that, so that was almost the catalyst for this revolution to begin with, not to excuse either, but the Dark Ages was a time of oppressive religious power, ruling by the sword for centuries. Uh, the Bible in the common tongue was outlawed in Europe. You had these, these pockets of Christians like the Waldenses who were keeping to the primitive faith. You had bold men like John Huss coming out and saying, no, we must believe in the Bible and, and make the Bible available to people in their language. And they were burned at the stake. They were persecuted. Then you get the Protestant Reformation that begins in 1517. Entire nations start, start breaking from Rome, Germany, the German princes with Luther. You get Switzerland and Geneva with Calvin and Zwingli. You get Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands. So we're starting to see some, some free places and Protestantism being allowed in Europe. France didn't go there, though. John Calvin attempted a reformation in France, a courageous man. His efforts at reformation in France were destroyed by the Catholic and French authorities, by the monarchy, by the priest, priest class, by the, by the papacy. He fled to Geneva, Switzerland, and the Protestants who did remain in France, called the Huguenots, they were terribly persecuted and many of them fled to the Netherlands. Interesting, just like side note, just personal side note for me. When I told you guys uh, last night that I, my uh, ancestors were from the Netherlands, a lot of that, that lineage is actually Huguenot. So the Huguenots who had fled France intermarried with the, the, the Dutch. I had a grandpa who was really into history and he would trace the genealogy and stuff. So I happen to know I got some French Huguenot in there too, but nonetheless, that's just a fun fact. Not an amazing fact, it wasn't that amazing. Anyway, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Oh, okay, so this was the moment in European history that solidified in the minds of all Protestants, all people of conscience in Europe, that Papal Rome was a bloody and ruthless force. They cracked down on these Huguenots and anybody who defied the Church of Rome in France with violent, violent massacre. Tens of thousands of Bible-believing Christians were slaughtered. So let's say this as clearly as possible. Christianity that attempts to rule with the sword and enforce its dogma is not Christianity. The Bible calls it Antichrist. So when the French Revolution is overthrowing that, the problem with them was they threw the baby out with the bathwater. They thought they were throwing out Christianity itself. They were throwing out Christianity itself. They thought they were just throwing out oppression. But they viewed religion itself as bad, kind of like Marx would, right? Karl Marx. Religion itself is inherently violently oppressive. We've got to get rid of all religion, they said. They couldn't see past the fact that the particular brand of Christianity, Antichrist, that had persecuted them was betraying the Bible. And if you allow true Christianity to thrive, you will find tolerance, freedom, peace. So lesson learned here, I guess. Satan is a master of having two opposites 
both of which are equally evil. Are you seeing what I'm saying here? You've got Dominion theology, Papal Rome, Constantinian violent domination versus atheistic, atheistic mass murder. Uh, they're both kind of bad, aren't they? The French Revolution, of course, began after the storming of the Bastille in July, ju on July 14, 1789. The mass uprising began against the monarchy, against the nobility, against the clergy. And again, they didn't simply remove oppressive religion. They sought to de-Christianize the nation altogether. But interestingly, you can't totally do away with religion because we are inherently... I guess spiritual beings were made in the image of God. God has put eternity in the hearts of men. So we will always look to something as supreme. Like what is the supreme thing? What is our true North Star? We know it's the Bible and Jesus Christ. But these guys are kind of scrambling here. They've just cast off all religion. So what are they going to do? They replace God with the goddess of reason. Finite human mind becomes God to them. They literally made a goddess, marched her through the cities on an appointed festival day to the goddess of reason. The churches, including the famous Notre Dame Cathedral, were seized by the revolutionaries and converted to temples of reason. They can't get away from the religious language, can they? But when we get to Robespierre's reign of terror and the guillotine, you have to ask the question, how rational, how humane, how sensitive to the rights of man was that bloodbath that became the reign of terror in France. Anybody who was suspected of being against the revolution was promptly slaughtered. It, they were decapitated by the guillotine. It was called the, the Committees of Public Safety. Robespierre wanted better PR than what we call it. You know, we, historians refer to it as the reign of terror. They used the phrase public safety. This is one of the darkest moments in European history. And I guess you can take a lesson and a, and a historical cue from that, that usually tyrants, usually things that strip people's life and liberty, property from them, are going to go under a guise that sounds nice, right? So we want to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. When we hear public safety, scratch under the surface a little bit and make sure, is this really about public safety? Or maybe a little closer to home. In our generation, in recent years, you hear phrases, homeland security, public health. These things are important and can be good, but are they always? And is this the real intention and the real fruits of these things? Or are they justifications for curtailing freedoms? Important questions we always have to keep before us to be thinkers, not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. So we got the opposites. I think you got the idea. Papal dominion is the opposite of the American system, uh, which we'll talk about more in just a second, and atheistic violent bloodshed is also the opposite. So this Protestantism, a republic, what is this all about? Listen to this from the Great Controversy. In that grand old document, which our forefathers set forth as their Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, they declared, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are, what's the next word there? Created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The French Revolution didn't acknowledge that there was a creator that endowed every person with their rights. And so their rights were surrendered and sacrificed. So God here is neither denied nor enforced, right? The authoritarian secularist state is not God. God is God. There is a creator and you have liberty to choose him. Over here, there's no church state either in the American system. No official church state religion. You have liberty. No enforcement. We all know this too. It says we hold these truths to be self-evident. This is something everybody intuitively knows. When you look at history and you go, yeah, this is unalienable to, to have your life and liberty respected. Your freedom of conscience validated and, and left alone. That is something that we all know to be right, and it's unalienable, can't be taken away. So summing up, the American Republic founded by Protestants acknowledged the Creator with no enforcement of religion and no restricting of freedom of conscience. So is it any surprise to us then that this land, America, not France, not Rome, became the wellspring of the 19th century missionary work that went global, the, the very prolific Bible societies distribu distributing the Word of God and what we're going to talk about this afternoon, the great Second Advent Awakening 
I put that one in highlighted yellow, the only slide you'll see the whole weekend with that, because that is really what this is all about, about lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, his character, and proclaiming his soon coming. But, you know, America's founding fathers, who established the founding documents that, that, that lay down these principles, they actually weren't the first. They weren't the first to come up with these ideas to, for example, separate church and state and not have a church state that enforces a state religion. These guys, way back in the 1500s, they were persecuted even by fellow Protestants who didn't have this idea quite yet. But the Anabaptists, you've heard of Menno Simons maybe. This was called the Radical Reformation. These guys were baptizing believers who were convicted of their sin, believing in Jesus Christ to be saved and baptized, dying to sin and rising again with Jesus not baptizing babies, which is not biblical, but, but uh, on, the, on the side of liberty, they were for, put the sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. They said, we Christians are not called to take dominion and enforcement of the Christian faith. So they were, they were radical and ahead of their time. Also in, the, in the, the Dutch Golden Age, we talked about in the Netherlands where the pilgrim separatists fled to from England. There was remarkable level, levels of religious toleration during that Dutch Golden Age. Various denominations given permission to operate unhindered, including those pilgrims that we, of course, talked about already. But how about American colonies that preceded 1776? William Penn, the Quaker, his colony Pennsylvania that he founded, had no state church at all, complete religious freedom in Pennsylvania. And the same thing in Rhode Island. These are the two most notable colonies. Roger Williams, one of the greatest heroes of the colonial period, the 1600s here. He founded Rhode Island as the most progressive and enlightened of all the colonies. He taught very clearly that the state has no business regulating the first four commandments. This is the last six commandments involve you no know, punishing murder and thief and, and thievery and, and making sure that there are contracts that are enforced and people are not bearing false witness in that regard, uh, marriage contracts and so on. So the last six involve our relationship man to man and the state has a place in that to keep order. Romans 13, it's, it talks about that very thing. But the first four commandments are about our relationship with God. And that is between the individual and God, and nobody can get between you and your Savior. So that, that, that was Roger Williams. So I'm going to mention him in just a second, why he had to found that colony. But this, this thing about um, the, the Mayflower Compact that I left you guys hanging on last time, do you remember that? We're going to talk about Roger Williams' ideas being adopted by the U.S. Constitution. But before Roger Williams, this is a, another example of, 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 of tolerance in a time of religious oppression. The, the pilgrims established on the Mayflower, developing their own civil body politic, they called it. They said, we the people, basically. I mean, this is a forerunner to the Constitution where we the people are, are establishing a free nation. And they did it themselves. They didn't ask the permission of bishops or popes or kings or anything. This was radical for its time. This was a pivot point in history, the signing of the Mayflower Compact on November 11, 1620. And I also love this document because this document allowed believers and unbelievers to be equal before the law. This didn't say, we pilgrims are going to lord it over you because we outnumber you. That was not their mindset. Uh, that was kind of the mindset in Massachusetts Bay. I alluded this to this last night. Puritans, wonderful people in so many ways, but they did not get this. They had been persecuted in England, and then they came over and, and became the persecutors. They banished Anne Hutchinson and Robert, Roger Williams from Massachusetts Bay Colony. It's a different colony than Plymouth. You see it on the map there. Some people pe uh, conflate these two in their minds. The pilgrims, they're the separatists. The Puritans founded Massachusetts Bay. Different colony, different mindset about church-state relations altogether. So that was why last night at the end we said, a city on a hill. Well, that's appropriately assigned a name for the church, for the people of God, of all nations all over the place. But if you're going to give that name to a colony, I would give it to Plymouth Colony or Rhode Island more so than Massachusetts Bay. Again, for all their virtues, uh, you know, they, 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 this is a black mark on their record, but it doesn't define them entirely, and the Puritans in Massachusetts, just to be fair. But we've got to look now at the founding fathers who wrote this American Constitution based on which colony's way of viewing things. Um, you had Virginia, that was an Anglican colony. It became Episcopal after the Revolution, broke from England, but a church state. You had Maryland, a Catholic colony. You had various colonies, usually a religion assigned to it. Um, Massachusetts, of course, Connecticut, they were Puritan colonies. When the Constitution was written, 
and when the Constitution was ratified, did the United States of America become a denominational entity? Have you ever read in the First Amendment to the Constitution, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Hands off that. And you shouldn't, free, you shouldn't prohibit the free exercise of religion either. Hands off in both ways. So you don't establish a religion or prohibit free exercise of religion like they do over here in these atheistic nations or like they do with this Roman papal model that many of the Protestants sadly didn't quite break from. But um, the Founding Fathers didn't follow the Massachusetts Bay Colony approach. They, they followed the Plymouth Colony, uh, or if you will, um, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Roger Williams, love that guy. So the U.S. Constitution in 1787 has been called the miracle at Philadelphia. We were doing a lot of miracle stories in the early part of this message, right? We kind of transitioned to talk about the principles of our founding here to understand the miraculous rise of liberty and how the earth helped the woman because the earth was this place that the pilgrims fled to at the tail end of the 1,260 years and then established as a land of freedom. The earth being a place that had been previously sparsely populated, became heavily populated because people really wanted to come to a land of freedom where you can exercise your conscience and keep the fruits of your labor as we saw in the, the, um, the great controversy last night. But here you have the Constitution, the miracle at Philadelphia, because God's working providence and miracles for a reason so that we can have a land of freedom to develop the church of God, the truth of God, go global with the mission work and so on. But even these somewhat secular founding fathers, and you know, they had their religious mindset about providence and stuff, but most of them were not in the same sense, you know, fundamental Bible-believing Christians as we are. But even they recognized, listen to George Washington about the Constitution of 1787. He said, it appears to me then little short of a miracle that the delegates from so many different states which states you know are also different from each other in their manners, circumstances, and prejudices, that these states would unite in forming a system of national government so little liable to well-founded objections. So in other words, almost all the states ratified the Constitution because voted to ratify the Constitution, there's very little objections to it. We came up with all these compromises. I used to teach in my history classes the, the Great Compromise and Three-Fifths Compromise and all these different compromises that they came up with to form a more perfect union. And I, I find that to just be quite remarkable that George Washington said this was a miracle that we were able to get along and that we were able to put a country together. James Madison said something very similar. He's called the father of the United States Constitution. He was even more amazed. He said the real wonder is that so many difficulties should have been surmounted and surmounted with unanimity, almost as unprecedented as it must have been unexpected. It is impossible for any man of candor to reflect on this circumstance without partaking of the astonishment. It is impossible for the man of pious reflection not to perceive in it a finger of that almighty hand which has been so frequently and signally extended to our relief in the critical stages of our revolution. Are you wondering in astonishment at the finger and the hand of God in history? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for showing yourself through history. It is truly your story. We want to dedicate ourselves more to you, to utilize the liberty you've given to us, to do your work, to follow your will, and to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.